It's no easy task getting here. But a true adventure never is. The North Rupununi of Guyana is one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. Covering over 54,000 acres, the Rupununi is the largest wetland found in Guyana. In the rainy season, waters originating from the Kanuku Mountains mix with those from Amazonian Brazil, creating one of the most biologically diverse regions in the world. At the heart of the Rupununi wetlands is Karanambu. I was here once before, 12 years ago. This here is a young male giant river otter and met a pioneer of conservation. We're here at Karanambu with Deanne McTurk, who is better known as the Otter Lady. I now return to this magical site, a place where everything's just a little bit bigger, from the water lilies to the trees to the personalities. No, not inside. I don't want you eating inside. You'll make a disgusting mess. This time, Deanne's niece, Melanie. Just the way a family group would. And Karanambu's wildlife guide, Kenneth help me and wildlife cinematographer Josh Lieberman film these giant river otters. This is amazing. And we learn what makes the North Rupununi of Guyana one of the last remaining great wildernesses on planet Earth. As humans, we tend to think of ourselves as separate from or above other animals. But we might not be that different from our animal cousins. We've become separated from the natural world, and it's time to reconnect. This is a wild connection. Well, Karanambo is, is very much the Mac Turk legacy. For Auntie Diane, part of it was that this is the family home. This is the, the home that her parents built. You know, the, the place of, of the, the Rupununi pioneers. This quite literally was one of the early pioneer sites in the Rupununi. You cannot tell the story of giant otters in Guyana without talking about Diane McTurk, uh, the otter lady. Come noonie, 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 noonie. Come benoni, benoni. Oh, there they are. They're coming. They're coming swimming. Come pee, she pee, she pee, she pee, she pee, she She was the first person to recognize that the, the Rupununi wetlands was a critical an important ecosystem. Well, the thing that makes Karen Amber so special is the fact that we have such a variety of habitat. We're extremely fortunately placed. If you look at the old legends, this is the place that the god Makanaima walked and talked with the leader of the people. This is where he would come to tell them important information. And so this area was held as special and sacred long be again long before there was a science to, to to say that this is the linchpin that holds the whole Rupununi wetlands together people knew that this was a special place and the way you behaved within this place had to be respectful well the uh, the otters actually the otters are very special and i never realized it until I actually got one. So the radio has always been in this little corner over here. And so we get frantic call on the radio. Miss Diane, Miss Diane, I have a problem. Auntie Diane in her, her, you know, very elegant way that she had, she would say, hello, how can I help you, you know? Oh, Miss Diane, my, my husband 
just brought me two baby otters. It was only then that I realized that the giant otters, although there were very, very few in those days, were being uh, still hunted for their pelts. And so therefore I then sent out the word and told people that if they came across an orphaned otter, they must please collect it and bring it to me. We wanted to extend yeah. that feeling of being part of those early days. And so one of the, the important things for us is that Karanambo is little changed. All right, I need somebody to taste. How does it taste? Sweet and peppery. Is that good? Tastes okay? Yes. <laughs> Please find me some rum. How are you supposed to cook without rum? <laughs> I mean, certainly there are changes, there are updates and everything, but the feel of the pioneer period, the, the buildings are the original style buildings with the thatch roof and the clay bricks that are made locally. Yes, there is solar electricity, but at the same time, there's no air conditioning. <laughs> You're not, you're not being uh, transported away from this area, but rather you are engulfed within the spirit of what Karanambu is when you are here. Sandy, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come away from the kitchen. Ah. Yeah, well, we're going outside. I don't want you eating it inside. No, no, not inside. I don't want you eating inside. You'll make a disgusting mess. Hmm? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go outside. If you just get outside, I promise you, you can have it. Yeah? Look, look. Stay outside, though. Stay outside. Stay outside, please! <sighs> As the story goes, the first one was, was a pet, but by having Frankie and loving Frankie, and uh, she learned more about otters and realized the threats that were facing them. And I think the wisdom of what she did really came to her empathy with people. She understood there was a financial prerogative. People were not doing this just because. She would gently say to them, she would say, um, well, I won't ask you what happened, but if there are cubs by themselves, bring them to me and I'll look after them. Because cubs cannot live on their own. They need a family group, and they need the support of that family group for about two years. It is a brutal um, existence in the wild. And for adults, the, the process of leaving your family group and creating a space in the world for you and your new family is incredibly violent. It's fraught with so many dangers. When you have those little cubs and they have no one else to care for them and even other otters are a threat to them. Um, you realize why Karen Ambu has to exist. So their den is further up the river? Yeah, yeah. Well, the creek, remember, this is a creek we came off of the main river. <laughs> Typically, are they are they nesting under like a tree, or yeah. is it like a, yeah, so they, they, the roots they, of a they tree? They like the the root ball mm -hmm. because it gives a certain infrastructure, and they'll excavate under there. And sometimes there'll be as many as two or even three chambers in there. But uh, one of the things I love about giant otters is that they are quite fastidious about their toilet habits. <laughs> so they have a particular spot that everybody does their toilet, and it runs off at the side, yeah. at the front. So inside is nice and clean. That's the latrine, right? Yeah. Where they, yeah, uh, and it also, of course, then gives them something to mark their right. territory. Otter just jumped in the water. Otter just jumped in right next to you, Josh. Yeah. It 
It's early morning and we've just come across a small group of giant river otters down the river. And it was quite interesting. We saw them up ahead of us and we're looking for them and then immediately they reappeared straight behind us. Very, very clever creatures. That was amazing, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's very typical behavior. <laughs> They're outfoxing us all the time, right? Well, it's the same thing they do to the fish, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you think they're in this particular area? Well, just look around. I mean, look at the fish activity we can see on the surface itself. They're here for breakfast. And giant river otters are quite particular about their habitats. They choose their little territories and home ranges very carefully. And one of the things they really like are oxbow lakes or corners in the river. And it's all about food. So these are the areas where the food is most active. And if you, if you look around us, you'll just see the surface is breaking the entire time with fish on the surface. And that's exactly what these otters are feeding on. I'm gonna try and get another look. They're very shy. Uh, there haven't been guests here for quite a while. So these giant river otters are not yes, that accustomed yes, to people, right? Yes. One of the other lovely things about this particular site is as the water goes down, they have a series of holes in here, so dens, um, which will emerge as the water goes down. So that, that can be pretty cool in the dry season. Giant river otter is also called Lobo de Rio, which means basically river wolf. And because it's such an incredibly large, voracious creature, it's almost an apex predator here. And even jaguars will be reluctant to target an entire group of giant river otters. In the 1940s through to the 1970s, they were hunted extensively for their pelts. And one of the very few areas in South America where giant river otters largely remained unmolested was in the Guyanan Shield, right here in Guyana, French Guyana, and Suriname. Well, it's about 3.30 a.m. and we're heading out on the river now to go stake out the otter's den. Weather is not ideal, but hopefully the rain will help keep our scent down, help cover some of our noise as we move into position and wait for the otters to wake up. So you may be asking yourself, why Josh, are you in a boat at 3.30 in the morning in the pouring rain going up a river? And well, I was asking myself that as well. You see, after Mel told me about the deep connections otters have with their families, well, I really wanted to document one of these families behaving completely naturally. And to do that, well, they can't really know you're watching them. So we're going to do something different. So here we are now, a few hours later. We pinpointed the otter's den across the river, and so we're going to set up on the bank opposite of them. Now, I'm not really sure what's going to happen once these otters come back. And to be honest, we don't even know if there's any otters coming back here. But Kenneth says they will, so this is where we are. Kenneth was born at Karanambu. An immense knowledge of the wilderness is deeply ingrained within every hard-earned wrinkle of his being. He's the kind of guy who may not say much, but when he does, you better shut up and listen. Because what he says could save your life. I'm pretty sure if there's one person who will lead us to the otters, it's gonna be him. At the time when Dee was talking about the sort of conservation she wanted to do here at Karanambo and how integrated preservation of nature was had to be with care for the people on the land itself. It was at a time when the models of conservation in the world were quite different. People were thinking that to preserve an area, you had to remove human contact. Whole um, tribes were being removed from areas with the misguided impression that, that that is what would protect the land. And Auntie Dee, I think, was one of the first people who really realized that 
nature, the land, the culture, the people, they are intertwined in this tapestry that you cannot pull apart. <laughs> You can see the setup is quite elaborate. So if they don't come to this one hole under this tree, yeah, there's not gonna be any footage of them. Once we're all set up, we get in position and then we wait. It's about 4.30 a.m. The rain is starting to slow down finally. The sky is clearing and we can start to see some stars poking out. Now it's time to just lay low. Here are we, a tiny little country. If you look at it from how, my, how many species are in each square mile in Guyana, we're like 13 times more diverse than Brazil is. Every part of Guyana is so critical. Protection does not mean that we do not use that resource. Protection does not mean that nobody's allowed to go into that space. The understanding that comes from having been grown here is what really helped to forge the idea that there was no way that you could have nature without the people and that there was no way to protect nature from people, that rather what we needed more of was people embracing nature, understanding nature, maybe even going back to many of the older ways. I would like to see a protected area system across Guyana, because that's what our wildlife needs. We are using nature-based tourism to drive community development, to create changes in local and village economies. Our mission to protect this landscape, this little piece of the world, is so critical to preserving all of the rest of the Rupununi. <laughs> it's, it's been tremendous fun. I've enjoyed it, and um, I hope that you have too. 
And um, well, sometime, somehow, maybe we will meet again. I would like that. Bye-bye.